Well, thank you. It's really great to be here. And it's quite a challenge as well, because I'm going to try and mix some sort of basic starting points of a few ideas, then talk a little bit about this demand centre, with so there's some empirical projects and practical examples, and you get to hear a bit about actual stuff going on. And then I'm really taking the opportunity, I've never done this talk before, I put it together for the occasion, to think about what does that empirical work add to the kind of starting points that I began with. So that's basically it. And that more or less fits the title. So that's, that's, a, that's a good start. Um, I'm going to... Some people know some of these ideas about elements and practices and some don't. So I'm going to spend a, just a few minutes to begin with um, introducing some really basic uh, observations. So here's a, here's a place that I'm just going to dive in at this point, right? There's lots of other history and ideas, but never mind that. This is where we're starting today. So um, there's a guy called Andreas Reckwitz. He wrote this sentence about practices. Now, practices I'm taking to be kind of shared and social. They exist across space and time. And he says they depend on particular interconnections between different elements. His list is quite long, mental activities, things, their use, whatever. So um, together with some colleagues, we thought this is a bit too long a list. Let's shrink it down and make it easy and manageable. Um, let's say that practices, when they're going on, involve the kind of, in that this is the diagram in the middle, they involve a kind of constant iterative linking of elements. So they're primary colours for good reason. It was like a kind of, well not a joke, but it was like taking the sort of, you know, scientific DNA, if you like, of, of the social world and pretending that you could make it up of elements, and we call it elements, like the periodic table, that kind of thing. Um, so the blue, I mean, you don't have to remember this, it doesn't matter, but the blue is the kind of material, uh, the red is the sort of skill and competence, and the yellow is uh, meanings, mental activities, something, something like that. So just to give it a little test, I'd be interested to know how many of you had a shower this morning. Put your hands up if you had a shower this morning and have a quick look round. Interesting. Okay, so not that. That involves the shower, the running water. That involves the idea. I don't know quite what that is. Possibly freshness, possibly just what you do, and certain kinds of abilities to get in. So that showering has not always existed. I mean, we know that. And it may not exist in the future. We don't know. But at the moment, it fits that picture. There's a kind of ongoing integration for many of you on every day. Now, I think that's... So like, you're just going to have to be a that idea. I have two other ideas, which are much harder, or like more, more weird, are difficult to, to get hold of. One is that before showering took hold, the elements of which showering is now made somehow were out there, ready, not exactly waiting to be integrated, but there were some notions of hygiene or freshness. Maybe there wasn't running hot water. Maybe that was the element that was sort of not there, but then when it was there, then the showering could be integrated. But if you go with this idea, you have to have a world which is slightly full of elements sort of floating around that, that could be linked, that aren't yet. And to think about the future, possibly, of showering, you have also to imagine, like, the idea that getting wet every day is terribly bad. Showering in place might break, and that's the other diagram. So um, that's it, really, by way of absolutely initial starting point. But, of course, that's not it. From that, and not only that, but from that, a huge agenda of other questions bubble up. So here's just some of the other questions that bubble up. It's true that most people focus on that integrating and making and breaking of links, which is the top diagram. But of course, so the one with the yellow, that one up there with the yellow circle, maybe that idea of freshness of showering was also part of laundry. Maybe that's a concept that connects practices together. Maybe it borrowed other ideas about the body. Maybe each time you do showering, you actually change the idea. Because showering individually and also in society has a long, long history. It's not the same. It's not fixed. It's not static. So these ideas about elements changing each other as they're integrated, they're constantly dynamic. It's not, there's not a sort of fixed element. 
And um, this funny kind of blotchy thing here, it represents the idea that there might be some kinds of geographies of the elements of practice. So where there is no running water or hot water, then the possibility of sharing, that's a hole, if you like, in the blue layer. So you t for the possibility of practices to take place, you kind of vaguely need those elements more or less available so that they can be stitched, stitched together. The other ones that look a bit different here are the idea of the circles with the purple and the blue are, are the ideas about people being kind of captured or recruited and the more people that do showering, the more showering becomes established. Um, if people run away from showering, then it becomes less established. That's, that's it. So, okay, so we wrote about this quite a lot. I'm not going to say very much more about that. Um, and uh, there's some sort of... I mean, it's really attractive. There's still plenty of more work to do in this area. But what it doesn't tell you very much about is how different practices connect together. And that's what I want to kind of move on from, from into, this, into this territory. So, um, so here's some observations about the kind of limits of focusing just on one practice like showering or various other things uh, at a time. If you do that, then um, in a way, quite a lot of questions about in yeah, the sort of bigger issues about how the social world hangs together. You, you can't quite see them if you, if you just focus on these little practices integrated. So this knitting in the background becomes a kind of theme. It's knitting in the background of the, of the image. And once you kind of go into that, and then this is... This, so these sorts of issues we thought about and then wrote the next one, next book, on the nexus of practices. And it, the language here is not obvious. I mean, I don't know other sociological studies of threading through or suffusing or... You know, we're kind of making up terms to catch some of the ways in which practices connect and hang together. Um, and I'm, I'm going to say a bit more about these, so don't, you know, don't worry about that at the moment. But how different areas of social life connect, and this wouldn't only be buildings and energy and transport and urban planning and so on, but it could be that area. And it could be other kinds of areas of family life as well. So it's not specific to any one topic. Um, but what we thought about with the kind of thinking about how practices hang together, then we could think of, like the running hot water, you know, the infrastructure of the home enabled not only showering but all sorts of other practices, and that was the kind of thread that, if you like, held a range of hot water-dependent practices together. Um, that, if you could see... So some of this is also a bit methodological. How can you see how practices hang together, and sometimes you can analytically identify some threads. But sometimes those sorts of connections are much fuzzier or like difficult to spot. So we came up with this idea about suffusing, and in the book there are people writing about sort of general understandings and discourse and language and concepts and so on. Um, you know, beliefs about romantic love, for example, run through, not in the way that hot water does, but they still connect in some fashion. So we opened up that box, and, um, and then this was a more a kind of response a little bit to uh, people who said, yeah, this practice stuff is fine. You get, and it's true, you do get hundreds and hundreds of PhD students studying one little practice. It's great for the micro rubbish, I say. Absolute rubbish. I mean, it is good, but, but you can never separate the micro is the macro. You know showering is water consumption on a massive scale today and, and hot water. So, so some more li bits of work were needed to show how practices accumulate and add up to make what look like big structures and that there isn't big and small, that they're both at the same time. So plenty on that. And then other people have been saying, ah, great, practice theory is fine, but um, it's a bloodless, soulless, lifeless kind of idea because what's happened to the people? Where are they? It was just practices you're talking about. 
And again, I would say rubbish, more or less, because how did practices come to be, other than by people as the carriers, as the enactors? Of course they're there. So we had to have a go at that as well. Um, and then others were saying, this is fine, this kind of like idea that the small is large and all this sort of flat ontology kind of stuff, but where is power? No problem there either. Um, power, in various senses, is part of all of those arrangements. And it is so, not because you have a kind of micro to macro, multi-level, hierarchical kind of structure of regimes and change, um, but because all of the things that I've described enable forms of accumulation, types of largeness. Practitioners are not equal. They have different kinds of opportunities. They're born into different situations. They have different kinds of competencies that change over their life course and shape what they can do next. It is not, a f I mean, it's kind of theoretically flat, but not empirically. You know, it doesn't mean that you can't study gigantic mountain ranges. I mean, it would be nice to have some Swiss mountains here to give a full sense of the scale of the sort of largeness and the multiple consequences <coughs> of the kinds of processes that I've been talking about. Okay, so that's the kind of, that's a, some elements, starting points, some unpacking where you go when you start to think about connections between practices. And now I'm going to change gear a bit um, and say, well, okay, so I'm running this five million pound research centre, five years, how is any of this of any value? To what kind of debates might this add? And also, um, essentially, who cares? I mean, you know, where does this, where does this, get you. So I'm going to talk about a handful of projects within the demand centre and then see how those sort of pushed on what's already quite a big agenda or filled, out, filled it out or added more topics to it. So this is, this is a bit of the demand website. We've got some postcards. These are going to become collector's items. I've got a handful left so if you want them you can get them. We finish in May next year. And our kind of um, pitch, our funding, our purpose was to work with theories of practice in the field of energy and mobility to say that demand for energy and mobility and where people go and why they do is not just kind of a consequence of, I don't know what, like, like the energy system or something. What, how much energy is used is an outcome of what people do. It's an outcome of their practices. So understanding these dynamics of practice should be central to engineering and the kind of physical sciences and energy supply and so it isn't, but it, it should be or could be. That was our, that was our claim. Um, so, so what did we do? How did we go on with that conjunction of a very kind of tangible, sustainable climate change, carbon reduction ambition and these concepts of practice? Um, I mean, there are, there's loads of projects. There are 18 <coughs> projects in this program. Um, and I'm going to talk about a few that, uh, the good thing is most of them are now finished, so I can actually talk about them, not only one at a time, but a bit in together. Um, what some of them have done is raise some surprising and unanticipated but really important questions about timing and energy demand. So because of the ways in which social practices connect, they don't happen at just any old time. Meal times would be an obvious example. You kind of have to sort of prepare the meal and it's probably not going to happen when you're at work, it's going to get more. So things about peak load in energy connect strongly to the temporal rhythms of practices. There are all sorts of things going on that matter for where practices happen. So the spatial is also on the move. And infrastructures also very interesting. So I'm going to talk about those, um, those issues more, starting with time and practice and the temporality as a kind of, I don't know what, not exactly outcome connection. This is a fantastic cardboard model of energy demand in Manchester in 19, between 1954 and 1955. And so it might take a bit of explaining. Each um, sort of card is a day. And somebody has carefully snipped or clipped, we don't know how actually, 
um, how much energy, electricity, electricity is being used. So you start off at night time with the shelf when there's not much, and then it goes up during the day. And there's a valley in the middle then at, at lunchtime when it drops down. But it's a full landscape because you can also read it over the year. So the higher, uh, there's a kind of summer, winter uh, flow going kind of across the length of it. Uh, and, it, and it's just really, nobody quite knows who it was made for, and it's just a really nice object. But what was happening, and what, what were the activities, what were the practices that underpin this undulating ebb and flow on a daily and a seasonal basis? How did those peaks come, and, and why? And what kind of concepts do we need about the societal synchronisation of social practices, must be practices, hanging together? in the way that, that makes these kinds of peaks. So a number of the projects that we've done um, kind of go into more detail into what lies behind that kind of representation of energy demand and that kind of model. So yeah, we talked about showering earlier, and the regularity of that is important. Um, so issues of sequence, so I mean, there's plenty of socio social theory on time which connect, can be connected to practices as well. Um, you know, drying comes after washing, and commuting remains a very important kind of starting work at nine in the morning. So we work, I mean, we have to work with lots of sort of non-academic organisations. Transport for London is one. If only they could get away from 9am, even half an hour, significantly, seriously, systematically, of course, the rush hours do extend on their own, but it, it's creating really bottlenecks of, of energy transport um, demand. How long, how long things last is also important. How long actually does the washing machine take to run? Um, how, do, how has that changed? And obviously, some things happen, not regularly, but depending on the weather. Every, you know, seasons and weather come into the time. And some timed events, institutionally timed events, sort of um, draw others together. So we worked a lot with um, uh, EDF and their sort of French data on electricity and meal times, not only in France, but in a different way in France, are tremendously powerful kind of um, focusing forces in that landscape of, of electricity. If meal was different, I mean, in Finland, it's not like France at all in terms of eating patterns. It's much flatter and there's no very, like, big lunch times and big dinner times. So the energy profile is different. No, so these are really massive kinds of issues um, for, uh, well, for decarbonising society, basically. So, so there are lots of topics that we kind of brought into the energy field from thinking about practices and from thinking about... And then thinking, having to contend with the temporality then generates further questions back for theories of practice. Um, we also, kind of, to go further into the temporality, we needed to pay attention to the role of, of technologies, of appliances. So we did, one, one of the projects was looking at the arrival of central heating in Britain. And it's clear that something like a gas boiler compared with a coal fire, which is roughly what it was played, completely changed, not just energy patterns, but it changed the rhythm of the day. You did not have to rake the ashes out. You don't have to kind of come in and light the fire. There could even be an automatic timer. And so these kind of um, rhythms then also matter for other practices, because if you're not dealing with the fire, you can probably be doing something else. And, and all of those, this is where again the sort of theories of practice and interactions between practices add up, because that, or that goes on alongside and together with other, other trends, um, for example in women's work. So this is a kind of time use um, study and it shows differences in kind of um, when men and women are at work on weekdays, and the dotted line for the women is the one to 
to look at. So you can see that from not being at work quite so much um, in 1961, then that pattern has really changed by 2001, and it's no doubt changed again. So how these sort of um, what look like macro shifts are also micro shifts, and they're, they're, it's a bit like the cardboard diagram. What lies behind this? What are the practices that actually underpin these kinds of peaks? And this temporality connects to the temporality of the central heating, to the laundry, and to all the other kinds of areas of daily life. To go back a little bit to the ways in which practices connect, it's not only sort of bigger shifts over time, but we've got to be really interested in the sequencing. Um, so this is some slightly fancy time use study data um, where it's been possible from time use diaries to figure out what people were doing before they got into a car and what they're doing after when they get out of the car and put that together. And for the transport studies world, this has been astonishing, because they never thought about why you were in the car. It was just kilometres travelled, and that was largely the dominant kind of discourse. So, of course, car isn't used for every kind of journey. So you, we're thinking about into which practices does car fit? What constitutes car dependence in a kind of social practice way? Then it turns out to be some slightly Ob some obvious things, so carrying goods, turns out to be exceptionally important for cars, but that includes a dog. So taking the dog for a walk turned out to be one of the highest car-dependent practices because people were taking the dog out somewhere. That's not a huge amount of all car travel, but, but freight, like shopping and, and ferrying people about the place is. But that's not... The transport studies world is fixated on commuting, and it doesn't really, and kind of, because of ha not having looked at the before and after activities, hasn't seen the centrality of the car to these other cargo kind of jobs. So that was, that was news um, to them, and that's about how practices string together over time. And in a way, developing it even a little bit further, um, here's a sort of picture of a project. Um, so we know from a wider field of social science, that institutions have rhythms, this one does, and hospitals do. People not only start work and finish work, but there are procedures and consultants and ward rounds and meal times in hospitals, and there are all kinds of things that have to come before. That's, that's entirely what these institutions are built around. So how do they, the institution itself, how does that constitute a temporal signature in energy demand, and how does that change? What is the role of the consultants and the professionals in making a situation in which people go into hospital at all times of day and night and come out between three and five? I mean, that's a, that's a kind of funneling made within the institution itself. And, of course, they come out into a city, into a world, and they're commuting in and out of it. So they're kind of engines of time practice coordination, somewhat like the meal time, but on a kind of massive scale. They, 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 they're the bellows of the, of the system, in a way. So, um, so now I want, just before I move on to the next topic, to sort of think how, well, those empirical projects have certainly sent messages back to the transport world, to the energy world, about time and sequence. But what have they... How have they helped us think about the relations between practices? What's their theoretical contribution to social practice theory? Um, I think they've ultimately raised some problems about how we conceptualise time in relation to practice. So it's easy to think of time as a resource that gets used up, a kind of zero-sum model. If you're doing the laundry, you're not doing something else. But also, the kind of idea of the day, or a week, or a year is an outcome of the kinds of practices with which that temporal period is populated. And in an even stronger sense, in a way, maybe you could say time itself is practice. So we began to kind of, we haven't solved any of this, but it's clear that temporality, energy, practices hang, you know, there's, there's more to do. 
in that territory. Um, and so is there in terms of these synchronization and the dominance and the sort of role of planning in making temporal rhythms and these, these kinds of bigger, bigger questions. I've got another block, a bit like that, um, but this time thinking about infrastructures. So um, infrastructures, are, there's plenty of work in kind of action network theory and science studies and some earlier versions of practice theory which look at devices, objects, and technologies. There's, that's no shortage of that. But I think infrastructures are weird and interesting because they don't connect to any one practice. That's their very purpose. Electricity is used in all sorts of different ways. It feeds and is part of many, many different kinds of social practices. Um, so, so we know also that infrastructures are, have a kind of odd and weird role in, I mean, in structuring and being part of and being outcomes of many practices at once. So they are quintessentially connecting. They're interesting for how practices link together. Um, so how, so, so, yeah, right, so how does that happen? Well, you can, again, take a kind of really simple approach. This is a map of the electric, the high voltage, an old map, but a high voltage electricity grid in the UK. And if blue is electricity, then you can see that blue is feeding into all sorts of different practices. That's what the grid is for. It's not single purpose. And you can see also that um, the role of electricity becomes part of the kind of changing another level of infrastructure, which is the infrastructure of the home. So if you go from the kind of big grid of the country, then that's not entirely separate from the light. It's a bit simple diagram, this. Um, the light, that's the yellow bit pouring out of the lamp and the socket. That ha the role of electricity is kind of dynamic, not only because of the grid. So we've got a coal fire here with the coal scuttle. Um, then we went through this history of central heating, then the fire gets sort of closed in as a range. And then, actually, then you get the back boiler and you get the kind of central heating radiator following from that. And then, actually, you do away with the fireplace altogether. And then, you know, things change to the contemporary world. So electricity hasn't been fixed in that, and it's not been defined by electricity. It's been, its role is defined by all those other kinds of relations going on around it. Um, so that uh, raised some odd conjunctions. Again, this is completely not the sort of topic that the research councils thought we'd get into. But we began to see that watching television and central heating were much more closely allied than might have been expected. So they roughly came in in, in kind of yeah, like early 50s, mid 50s in Britain together. And you can see why they came in together when you think about it, because watching television is quite sedentary, basically sitting down. You'd have to light a fire in another room, because the fire would have been in the kitchen, so you're not watching them. So the space or the infrastructure of the home is kind of caught up in this dynamic of television and central heating together. And, and probably more than that, but that's just one example of where paying attention to the interconnections between infrastructures and multiple practices opens up or lets you see relationships that perhaps wouldn't have been, certainly not central to normal energy policy. But it carries on. So online viewing of television changes the evening schedule now. So we're working with the BBC to think about energy demand, you know, stuff like that. It, you wouldn't have got there without paying attention to these topics. So here's a little bit more complicated um, that example of how electricity changes with the infrastructure of the home, you can extend that and say, well, actually, electricity and, and objects don't have a fixed role. The exact nature of their role depends on the world in which they're mobilised. So um, in that simple blob diagram, the red, yellow and blue, blue was just one you know, blob. But that contains within it some much more sophisticated, much more subtle kinds of relationships. Some 
things that have a material role in relation to practices are also infrastructures. They're part of many practices. Some things have... Um, uh, they're a kind of direct interface. So a freezer is not like electricity. I mean, you can use it for a variety of things, but not that many. Um, the frozen food that goes in it is a kind of consumable. It's sort of used up. So the relation between different types of things and practice is not the same, but um, commuting along a particular road or preparing a meal or doing office work involves different combinations of these roles. That was the idea of the integration. But I think from paying attention to infrastructures, we've gone back to practice theory and saying, hang on a minute, this representation of materiality is far too simple. We need to really begin to think about these different roles. And it's not that an object has a material function by rights or by the very fact of existing. It depends how it's integrated. And that then... Um, so this is now where the work from demand on infrastructures pushes back into practice theory. Um, that then says, well, if you were building a house, for example, then you would need, I mean, now, you would have some electric power tools, you'd need an electricity supply, and you would need the, t the drills, that, those are the kind of direct, that's how you use the electricity in making the house, and you need a lot of other kits as well, and you're assembling that. So what's in the background then is the grid, that's still there, um, but the house itself is not in the background because that's what you're building. So, but when the house is built and people are inhabiting it, it falls into the background. It's then the shell, that's what they're living in, that's where they're watching television. <coughs> and so there's something quite complicated about kind of building, production, inhabiting, rearranging, and so on. And it's through those chains, if you like, that the kind of everyday practices connect to the global economy. It's through those kinds of sequences. Frozen food is part of a global food system. And it's through these kinds of relations, I think, that what look like little everyday practices are part of a macro kind of, if you like, macro kind of system. So. Again, that wasn't fully expected, but interesting. One third, like smaller and last block of this nature, was to think about um, where, where practices happen. So we have a project within demand which was about office space, and um, the sort of starting puzzle was, was kind of clear. Why are so many offices in Britain air conditioned? Because bit odd, really. Um, and then you begin to think, what is office work and how does property, office property, connect to office activity? And so then you have to think, what is actually an office for? And that's obviously changed over time. And how office work has changed is by an influx, not of one technology, but lots and lots of them. So there's a picture of a telephone there, which was at one point a major transformation, but it, it's got a cable. Now, mobile phones don't have cables like that, and various kinds of battery and laptop technologies don't have cables like that. And office workers come to depend on laptops and mobile phones and so on. So it's sort of why now? What is an office now? Where do you need an office? What, you know, there's other things about talking with other people and so on. Um, but it, it raises further questions about sort of tethering um, and detethering and the spatial anchoring of practices and how is that itself on the move. So um, it clearly is. Here's some uh, sort of figures from completely straightforward property consultant types who are dealing with corporate clients and saying, what kind of office space would you like? And this just shows you, from 1990 to today, the multiplicity of different locations in which office activity can go on. Now, that's, that's mattering to the city. That's mattering to the Greater London Authority that we've worked with. It's mattering because London has a huge amount of fancy office space. So what's, how is it serviced? What's it for? What's, what's going on there? And again, this is way beyond the normal transport energy kind of agenda. And, and actually, we've utterly failed 
to make the Greater London Authority Energy and Environment team talk to the property department, even though they should. Um, the online shopping would be another kind of example where there's some quite interesting changes going on in where practices happen. So, data is interesting not only in where things happen, but I think for the energy world it's also intriguing into, as a kind of question of like those sort of suffusing issues that I began with earlier. How has IT crept into different practices? We have a PhD project on the role of the tablet computer. And it's not one thing, it's not an infrastructure, but it's a kind of connecting point between really many different sorts of practices. So that more intriguing things, how to conceptualise these kinds of relationships. And in energy terms, it's not just the energy that you're using, it's the energy in the server room miles away and the data center even further away. And so the spatiality and the temporality are kind of, yeah, it all gets a bit complicated. And so for the energy carbon reduction kind of world, I think we've said quite a lot about technologies and infrastructures and practices, but energy policy is sort of part of this. It's not separate from it. Needs are not just out there waiting to be met. And for the kind of practice theory world, I think we've, opened up cans of worms, haven't resolved very many of them, but about these temporal, the spatial, the digital connections and these kinds of things. Um, and so I've got just a few pictures now of, of what I think might be some of the current, and they're, they are like pictures, so there's no deep thinking behind them, but they're just a clue as to where you might go, as to some different kinds of metaphors and language that might be useful in getting more of a grip on some of these sort of emerging topics. So I think chains are interesting, and this connects a little bit to the sequence thing. But you couldn't, a chain is a bit, a bit linked, I mean, obviously. So I think these sort of bundles of chains or bundles of collections of linkages of different natures, something, I'm going to move on fast because this doesn't really uh, hold, but they're quite, you get the idea, they're nice pictures. And I also think, um, here's a mass of roots, actually, but there are places and areas where there might be thicker or thinner forms of connectivity. And I think the digital is kind of perhaps rearranging some of that landscape. How exactly we tell what's thick and thin, uh, I'll skip over that too. Um, there's some quite intriguing ideas. I mean, Reckwitz talks about people as the crossing points of different practices. And I think practices are also crossing points of other practices. So you kind of get, um, it's a bit like the thicker and the thinner idea. There's a sort of either spatial or temporal intersection, junctions in a way. Um, so here's a picture of some people on a seaside, but they've all come there from very different routes. The seaside is part of one family history. It's the first time somebody else has been there. there. Um, they're all part of different worlds and they're all in the same place at the same time. So this, this beach is also a kind of crossing point of lives in some way. Again, it doesn't really work, so I'll move on fast. And I think the scale, um, these are fish scales, and that's not bad because there's lots of little scales that make up scale in that sense. And clearly there are some issues about accumulation that we've been touching on. Um, and but it's not fixed, like a fish moves, then the scalar is also quite dynamic. And to catch that, we need a whole lot of new words about not fixity, but relative obduracy or circulation. Some of this is from Ted Shatsky's work. Um, the hybridization and fragmentation of practices and these, these kinds of, these kind of unknown um, directions in a way. So I think, I'm. Um, to kind of finish, those ways of thinking about power and large and scale, which need to draw on this more um, unusual vocabulary. And we need to think about becoming, processes of becoming and sort of scaling, literally scaling in different ways. And also how potentially really established complexes of practice 
fall apart. So the, whilst there's a great tradition of innovation studies, there's none on disappearance studies or loss studies or fragmentation studies, but I think that would be important. And, but there's no kind of, I say case-specific art at the bottom because I'm not sure there's any kind of recipes as to how to go, go on here. And I think across the whole field, we've begun to think about the changing nature of connectivity itself. And again, this might be issues for urban planners and all sorts of different fields. Of what are connections made and how does that work? So to finish, to go back, so we, you know, we have to be useful and relevant to government and stuff like that in the demand centre. And showing them pictures of scales and chains and stuff doesn't work, not directly. But what we have said, and this has been slightly influential, is that we've said that not all policy that matters for energy is energy policy. And we've invented this term of invisible energy policy, which are all the policies about healthcare, about education, about kind of infrastructure or investment, which actually matter for the dynamics of practice, and they're not energy policies. So it, the trouble is, if you go then to people in the Department of Health and say, by the way, you're doing energy policy, they say, no, we're not, we're doing health. And if you go to the energy policy people and say, hang on a minute, you're not, you know, there are other people doing it, they say, no, 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 we do it. So there's a few things about institutional arrangements that hold the visibility and invisibility quite firmly in place, and we have to, we have to deal with that. But we can't ignore the fact that energy demand is actually being steered by all these other kinds of arrangements that deal with space and time and infrastructure. So I think I'll finish there, invisibly. <laughs>